It's about 6 a.m. and as you can see, the sun hasn't even come up yet. But I'm here at the Morongo Casino gas station, which is about 15 minutes west of Palm Springs. And I thought I'd better fill up my tank before I get back on the freeway and head to the cemetery I'm visiting today. It's about an hour and a half drive from here. And a full tank will definitely get me there and back. Over the years since I started my graveyard channel, I know I've been to the cemetery at least three or four times. But I didn't know until just this week that the person I'm hoping to find and visit today was laid to rest here. Some of you may recognize this as the cemetery where singer Karen Carpenter was originally laid to rest before she was moved a number of years later to her current final resting place which is in Westlake Village Memorial Park in Westlake, California. And the last time I was here I checked and her original crypt was still unoccupied. Many, if not most, of the cemeteries here in Southern California opened their gates at sunrise, which was about an hour ago. But Forest Lawn is pretty strict about when they open their gates. And even if there's a line of cars a mile long waiting to get in, and there's a guard at the gate with keys standing there for 10 minutes, they won't actually open the gates until exactly 8 o'clock. They're definitely very formal here. Hey everybody, Steve here at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Cypress, California. If you're not familiar with Cypress, California, it's just a, a few miles away from Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland. So that gives you an idea of where it's located here in Southern California. It's in Orange County, California. And as you can see, I'll turn the camera around here. The gates aren't open yet, so I'm sitting here in a long line of cars waiting to get in. So while I'm waiting here to get in, I thought I would tell you about who I'm here to visit today. This is a very sad story, very, very unusual story kind of confusing story about a, a man who was pretty well known when he died back in 2009. He died on November 27, 2009 here in Southern California. And some of you may remember his story. I think it made national news when it happened. Here in Los Angeles, he was a pretty well-known sports writer with the Los Angeles Times. And he was married to another writer who also worked for the LA Times. And her name was Lisa Dillman. And what makes this story so unusual is that in 2007, he made the decision to transition from being a man to being a woman. He changed his name from Mike Penner to Christine Daniels. And he came out to the world as a transgender woman and even started writing a blog for the LA Times about the transition. The blog was called Woman in Progress. When he came out publicly and made this announcement, his wife, I don't know if she was caught off guard, how much she knew about this in advance, but from what I've read, she was not happy at all. I guess she was embarrassed and felt like he had publicly humiliated her, at least from, I read, from what I read. And she immediately divorced him and not only divorced him, but disowned him. Even though they still both worked for the LA Times, she apparently said she never wanted to see him again. And she hoped that she wouldn't run into him at work at all. And she was not happy about what happened. Apparently, this kind of took him by surprise and devastated him. So they were both devastated by this decision that he made. I don't know how long it took him to decide to make this decision. I mean, he was around 50 years old, I guess, when he decided to make the transition to being a woman and to change his name. But shockingly, about a year and a half after he made the decision to transition and to live his life as a woman, he changed his mind, reversed his decision, and decided to go back to his original name. He decided to no longer be Christine Daniels, but to be Mike Penner once again. And then shortly after making this decision, he ended up taking his own life. He died from carbon monoxide poisoning, I wasn't able to find any information about exactly what happened, but I'm assuming he was probably in his car, maybe in the garage. That seems to be fairly common when that happens, when someone decides to end their life that way. And sounds like an awful way to go. He was 52 years old at the time. He died on November 27, 2009 in Culver City at the age of 52. So I'm not sure how he ended up down here in Orange County in the city of Cyprus. Well, now that I think about it, I, when I was looking at his Find a Grave memorial page, I think he is buried next to his parents. And so I've mentioned that on this channel before many times that members of the LGBTQ plus community, when they die, are often buried with their parents, especially if they're not married, if they don't have a spouse. And even if they were married and had a spouse, they're still often not buried with their spouse, especially if the spouse was also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. 
that's a whole other story, and I'll do a video about that at, at some point. But obviously, he was divorced at the time, and no spouse is listed. When I first read this story, one of the first things I thought of was, besides being just how sad and tragic this story was, I mean, to finally, after having the courage to live the life of who you really are, to live your life authentically, and then to, for whatever reason, change your mind. It, my first thought was, I wonder how many transgender people change their mind after making the change, after deciding to live as the opposite sex. And I don't know if he had surgery or not. That would complicate it even more and, you know, it makes you wonder. I mean, if, if, if he hadn't had the surgery yet, I guess it'd be much easier to go back to living as a man. But if he had had the surgery, that would make it a little bit more difficult or a lot more difficult. Before coming here today, I was going to look up and, and see if there's any information online about how often that happens, where someone makes the transition at whatever age and then later decides that they've made a mistake and to go back. Obviously, he had some, some issues. You know, I don't know if there was any mental illness, depression. I mean, and, and of course, it makes you wonder. To make a decision like that would be so difficult. And then to make the decision to go back, to, to transition back, would be just as difficult, maybe more difficult. I'm sure it was just, he was very distressed, mentally distressed, mentally anguished, second-guessing his decisions. Okay, it looks like the uh, person who's unlocking the gate just arrived. So let's see if we're going to be able to go in. It does look like they're opening the gate, so that's good. The line of cars here this morning is really long, so maybe they decided to open a few minutes early. Oh no, I'm looking at my phone and it says 8.04, so okay. <laughs> I guess I've just been talking a lot and not realizing the time went by pretty fast. So I know this section, I have the map here, and I've been here quite a few times before in the past. I've shared gravesite visits from this cemetery. You may remember some of them, especially most of them I think are on my other channel, the Graveyard Channel. And if you watch that channel, then you may be familiar with some of the people I've visited here in the past. It's surprising for being in Orange County, not Los Angeles County or Hollywood, how many famous people are laid to rest here. So the map that I have indicates that he's laid to rest over here in the sheltering, I think it was sheltering pines? sheltering trees section and I've actually been to that section before and visited a couple of grave sites in that section not knowing that he was laid to rest here at the time that happens actually a lot so it's this section over here sheltering trees you can see on the curb there but it's a huge section and it's a, the his final grave memorial page says it's lot 12 or plot 12. So let's go here, which is about halfway up on this street here. Now this is assuming that the information on finding grave is correct, which most of the time it is, but not always. So you never know for sure. And so when it starts curving, according to the map, when it starts curving over this way, that he's supposed to be somewhere in the middle there. And so I'm going to park right here, and we'll just see if I can go find him now. The temperature says it's 53 degrees. I've got my shorts on. <laughs> I had my longer pants on this morning, but I stopped for gas, and it was so warm. I was just so warm, I couldn't take wearing my long pants, so I switched. But it is, as you can see, it's sunny and beautiful out, so I don't think it'll be too bad. We'll see. I'm using the Find a Grave Memorial Page app on my phone, but unfortunately, there's no GPS to click and guide me to the gravesite. So if other people have been here before, they haven't added that to his memorial page. Once you find the gravesite, you add the GPS by standing at the gravesite and you click the Add GPS button, and then it just automatically adds a GPS to the memorial page which makes it easier for people to find in the future if they're using the app. Fortunately, the cemetery does have these little cement markers which indicate the lot numbers, which is really helpful. When I said earlier that this was so sad, this story was so sad, I think what I meant was, I mean, it's sad on so many different levels. On one level, it's sad because when you think about 
transgender people right now in our society here in the U.S. There's so much hatred and so much discrimination and politicians are just stirring up so much hatred on a daily basis toward transgender people that it's got to be terrifying to be a transgender person right now in America, anywhere in the world, but even here in the U.S., which is just completely so sad. But to make it even sadder then, knowing that so many people in the world hate you and want you dead and are doing everything they can to cause harm to you, then to be someone who is actually able to transition and to accept himself or herself and then for whatever reason to take his own life. I mean, I think I've mentioned on this channel before just how many transgender people are murdered each year. They're there are, it's just unbelievable. Hundreds and hundreds in this country are murdered each year. So for me, it just makes it even sadder knowing that not only do you have to deal with people who want to kill you, but then you have to deal with your own depression or mental anguish, whatever would cause you then to want to take your own life. That's just a, a double tragedy, I think. And it's possible that one of the reasons that he was in so much pain that would drive him to take his own life was maybe because of all the discrimination and the hatred generated toward transgender people these days. According to this online report that I just googled, 81% of trans adults in the U.S. have thought about taking their own lives, and 42% have attempted it. And both of those percentages are shockingly high. But given the extremely hostile religious and especially political climate, it probably shouldn't come as a big surprise to anybody. And it's just as bad or worse all over the world. I'm glad I was able to find his gravesite and I just added a GPS to his Find a Grave Memorial page so it'll be much easier if anyone else is coming to visit in the future. Although this was pretty easy to find. Whoever put together the information directions on the Find a Grave Memorial page did a great job so thank you for that. Another indignity that transgender people have to deal with after death is that often they're dead named. That's a phrase that means if you've tr transitioned, let's say from a man to a woman, and you now have a, a female name, that your family or others, after you die, they refuse to bury you with the name and identity that you chose. Instead, they bury you with the name that you were born with going against your wishes and you have no choice after you're gone so that happens a lot it's called dead naming where they refuse to acknowledge the name that you chose and the identity that you chose while you were still living so that's just you know the final indignity and that happens a lot in this case with mike he did transition back to mike so apparently at least at the end he wanted to be known or remembered as mike not as christine so that's fine you know however you want to be known while you're alive however you want to be known after death that should be your decision not someone else's decision and it doesn't hurt anyone else if you change your identity, if you change your name, it's nobody else's business, but people are people and many people make it their business to decide for you how you should live your life and how you should be remembered after you die. But in this case, it seems that he did want to be remembered as Mike instead of Christine, which is fine. Let me know in the comments if you visited his gravesite, what you think of the story, what you think of the journey he went through, and if you know of another transgender person who had a similar experience, or if you know of a transgender person who's buried somewhere here in California or somewhere around California, maybe Nevada or Arizona, somewhere where I could actually drive. If you have a personal story you'd like to share of someone, a family member or a good friend that you'd like me to visit, if it's possible for me to find them, if you know where they're located and you'd like to let me know, please do. And if I can, I would be happy to visit their gravesite and share their memories. Especially if they have a tragic story that needs to be told, that needs to be remembered to possibly help prevent tragic stories like this in the future. Let me know in the comments section. You can also contact me on Instagram and then we can kind of go from there and see if it's someone that I would be able to, to find and visit. This week I want to give a shout out and a very big thank you to my newest channel supporters, K Will or Quill and Clifford Sheffield. 
Thank you so much for your generous donations to this channel using YouTube Super Thanks. They are very appreciated and definitely help make trips like this possible. And as we start another new year, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have supported this channel over the past couple of years. By donating to this channel, by sharing these videos with your friends, by giving these videos thumbs up and leaving comments, and especially for taking the time to subscribe. It's all been very helpful and is very appreciated. So thanks for joining me today and helping to keep the memories alive of people who often are forgotten after death. That's one of the reasons I visit these grave sites. They're not often visited. As you can see, his grave site is one of the few here in this section or in the cemetery that's not decorated. So I don't know if he has anyone to visit him anymore. Some people no longer have family and he was divorced. Until our next trip to the cemetery together. Thanks for sharing the memories, everybody.